Good morning. It is good to be back here among you today. I uh, recognize many faces, but it seems like there could be a few new faces that I don't know. And so you are welcome to be here. I bring you greetings this morning from Trinity Baptist Church in Montville and the assurance that we love you, that we are praying for you each and every week, and that we are praying that the Lord would strengthen the work here in Newark, this light in a dark city. So this morning we are going to be in the book of Colossians. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to the book of Colossians. We're going to start in chapter 2, but our verse is in chapter 3. But to ensure that we all have context and we're all on the same page, we're going to begin in chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to begin at verse 16. It says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And here are our verses this morning where we are going to focus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Amen. Saints, let's pray once more for the ministry of God's word this morning. Father, again, we come to you and we come now to that meat that is your word as we come to hear your truth. As we come, Lord, to raise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring glory to him, and to preach your gospel, that is the good news of salvation unto sinners. Lord, we bless you that you have given us this one day out of seven, during which we may set aside the cares of this life and indeed seek the things that are above. And so we pray for your Holy Spirit to abide with us now as we come to seek those things, that you would give us focus, that you would give us clarity. For, Lord, we have not come to hear a man but to hear you. So please, Lord, be with us now in all that is spoken and in all that is heard. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in his name alone, amen. Amen. There is a story of a boy, a mud puddle, and the ocean. And the story goes like this. There's a little boy who loves mud puddles. Every time it rains outside, the next day he comes out and he finds puddles of water that are gathered next to the land where his house is. And as a result of the water being gathered next to the land, what ends up happening is the water touches against the dirt and it creates mud. And this little boy, five or six years old, loves mud puddles. 
He comes outside, he plays in them, he splashes in them, he sits, he digs in there, he gets dirty. He loves mud puddles. One day his mother comes to him and says, we're going to the beach today. The little boy says, I don't wanna go to the beach. Mom says, trust me, you're gonna enjoy the beach. There's another type of dirt there called sand and you can play in that and you won't get so dirty. The boy says, I don't want to go to the beach. I want to play right here. The mother tells him about the ocean, tells him about the waves, tells him about the breeze, tells him about the beauty of the ocean, of the sea. And the boy says, no, thank you. I'm content to play right here in the mud puddle. And saints, I believe that's what is taking place here or what's at risk there in the land of Colossae. They've been in, inundated with a false teaching and as a result, there's this temptation to focus on the mud puddle. But Paul comes and he wants to remind them of the ocean. He wants to remind them of things that are not seen. He wants to remind them of Christ. He wants to remind them of things above. And so we come this morning to Colossians to investigate these things more closely. And so if you're taking notes and you're looking for a sermon title, you can title this Seeking and Setting Above. Seeking and Setting Above. And so let's begin with the context here. And I'm sure most of you are aware of these things, but again, just in the event we have any visitors here, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. And so as with most ancient churches, the church in Colossae was established through the work of missions. Many of the New Testament churches were established in a similar framework by the work of the Apostle Paul. But in this instance, when we're talking about the church in Colossae, the situation is a little bit different. This was not a church that was established by the apostle, but instead, it looks like it was established by a man named Epaphras. And so history would suggest, and even chapter one outlines for us, that the apostle Paul was on a missionary journey in Ephesus, and what likely happened is that this man, Epaphras, from the land of Colossae, travels over to Ephesus, and he encounters the apostle Paul. He encounters a man who was preaching and who was teaching, but more than that, he actually has an encounter with the living Christ. He hears the gospel. He comes to believe the things that Paul has spoken. And as a result, the Lord Jesus is pleased to raise yet another man to life. And so what does he do? Well, he does what probably most of us have done when the Lord converted us. He goes back to his home country and there begins to proclaim the very things that he heard from Paul, the things he had come to believe. And as a result of him spreading these things, evangelizing his neighbors, perhaps even members of his own family, what ends up happening is that the church in Colossae is established and gives way to what we now know as the letter to the Colossians. However, what ends up also happening is that Epaphras then meets with Paul again. And we don't know all the details behind this, but more likely than not, Epaphras goes and meets with Paul while Paul is in the midst of his missionary journey, and he begins to tell him about the church in Colossae. He has perhaps good things to say, but he also has some challenging things to say, because as I said, a doctrine has crept into Colossae that is not of the gospel, and there's a need to see this corrected. And so Paul does what Paul does best. He takes out a pen, he gets the parchment together, and he begins to write the letter to the Colossians, which is what we have before us this morning. And so what I want to do is I want to examine verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. And we're going to do it under two headings this morning. And I tried to keep the headings rather simple. The first heading is up, up, and up. The second heading is things above, things on earth. Up, 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 and then things above and things on earth. And so starting with our first point this morning, up, 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 our first subheading is from verse 1, part A. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ. 
Paul presents the Colossians with this if-then statement. And in language, it's known as a conditional sentence because the if precedes the then, which is meant to help express either possibilities, hypotheticals, perhaps even consequences. And we use these sentences all the time. You think about it in the context of weather, you say, well, if it rains tomorrow, then I might not go outside. So that's our if then, or you think about it in the context of children, you may tell young children, if you finish your dinner, then you can have some dessert. Again, sticking with food, maybe because I'm hungry. If you don't eat now, then you'll be hungry later. Again, the conditional sentence is to express a possibility of what will follow if something happens first. But that's not the Apostle Paul's intent when he uses the if-then sentence. I think Paul is after something different. And so what I believe is that Paul is seeking to graciously provoke the Colossians to a certain course of conduct. Now, before we see the conduct provoked, we need to examine Paul's prefatory phrase again. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ. We need to unpack this because to see this language should trigger a number of things in our minds. We should consider when we see this phrase, the death of Christ. We should think about the burial of Christ. We should think about our own baptism, specifically by means of immersion, the going down under the water and then the coming up out of the water. This idea of being raised with Christ should also raise us to consider Christ's resurrection as well as the rising up again from the waters of baptism. So when Paul asks this if-then question, this is not Paul attempting to be clever. Paul is not doing a theological Q&A. He's not testing them. Paul is being very sincere in what he says because everything that's going to follow Paul's remark here hinges on this statement, if then you have been raised with Christ. And so I want to show the weight here. And so you're going to turn with me, please, to a couple of different passages. I'm going to ask you if you would please turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. We're going to start at verse 1. This is Paul writing to the saints in Rome, and he begins by saying, verse 1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Can you see it? The five themes that I just highlighted about the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, our baptism, those things are all bound up in what Paul is saying here in these first four verses of Romans 6. And something of the weight of it should begin to grip us as we consider it. And I want you to kind of go back with me to when Paul is writing this letter. So Paul in this situation is answering a question which was raised by his ops. If you're under the age of 17 and not many of us are, you probably know what ops are. I've got a couple of kids here who understand some of this new slang that these children are using. But the word ops is an abbreviated form of opposition. Paul is addressing the Jewish opposition. He's addressing those who would oppose the gospel. And so remember what happens in chapter 5. And we're not going to look at that this morning. But in Romans 5, Paul begins in verse 1 with the phrase, if we have been justified by faith. He says we have been justified by faith. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And then he goes on at some length to talk about the efficacy and the meritorious nature of the blood of Christ and how it cleanses from sin and how it saves from wrath and how grace triumphs over sin at every turn. These are weighty things that the Apostle Paul is bringing meant to encourage and strengthen the church. But then someone hearing this may say, well, Paul, if this is how things are now with God because of the work of Christ, 
then we can live any old way that we want to. So can't we just keep on sinning that grace may abound? Paul says that's carnality, and he swiftly condemns it. He says, by no means. But then he goes on and he brings us to this idea of being raised with Christ. Again, verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You may have heard this phrase before, but what Paul is actually speaking to is this idea of union with Christ. It's an incredibly weighty, difficult to fully comprehend doctrinal mystery whereby the Christian is intimately joined to the Lord Jesus Christ. So joined is Christ to his people that when you look at Acts chapter 9, where Paul is on the road to Damascus, when Jesus comes to Paul, he says to him what? He says, Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now think about that. Because the reality is that Paul had never seen Jesus in the flesh. He had never encountered Christ. He didn't see Christ like the disciples did. And yet Jesus is saying, why are you persecuting me? Paul says, who are you, Lord? Saul says, who are you, Lord? Saul and Paul, we know him as Paul. Who are you, Lord? And he answers, I am Jesus. Paul still didn't fully get it, but the reality is, is that for everything that's happening to the people of God, for everything that's happening to the people of Christ, it's happening to Christ himself. It's almost as if to say, if I pinprick one of the saints, Jesus feels it. This is the idea of union with Christ. And so for a loose definition, union with Christ is that pivotal truth that the Christian is mysteriously joined to Jesus and through a divine work, we actually have participated in his death and his resurrection. And so just to kind of summarize this and bring it together in a very, very simple phrase to understand, when Christ died, you died. If you are in union with Christ, when he died on the cross, Romans 6, 2 tells us that you have died to your sin. When Christ was buried in the tomb, you were buried as well by means of baptism. And so even Paul says in Colossians chapter 2 that death with Christ occurs to the elemental spirits of the world. So again, when Christ dies, the believer has died also, but it doesn't stop there because when Christ rose, you rose. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Colossians 2, verse 13. And I should have said this earlier. I'm reading from the ESV, so bear with me if you are a New King James reader. Verse 13 says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. Paul pronounces to the Colossian Christians, dead in trespasses and sins before believing on Christ, and yet they are made alive together with Christ. And so the Colossians didn't stay dead in trespasses and sins, just like Christ didn't stay dead in the tomb. Likewise, as Christ didn't stay dead in the tomb, the believer doesn't stay dead beneath the baptismal waters. But it doesn't matter because whether the tomb or the waters, take note of this, that Christ and his people are both joined in his death, but also joined in his resurrection. You don't need to turn there, but in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So it follows that by the work of the spirit of the living God, that when Christ was raised, the saints in Colossae were raised. 
Likewise, when Christ was raised, if you are here this morning and you are in union with Christ, you were raised as well. And so what is the end of this matter on being raised with Christ? In other words, those who are genuine followers, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, are those who have been raised with Christ. I want to show one more verse just to drive this point home. So please turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, and we're going to begin at verse 4. Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If we didn't hear anything else this morning, we have enough to rejoice at if we are in Christ today. Christ rose. We are no longer dead in trespasses and sins. Our sin has been forgiven and pardoned because of the work of Christ. It is a good thing to be in union with Christ. All of this is just foundation because now that Paul has clarified, if then you have been raised with Christ, now he's going to go on to give some exhortations, but really they're commands because this brings us to our second subheading this morning. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And so what we have is the fact that truth must now give way to action. Truth standing in isolation from action on the part of the believer doesn't exist. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> it is not enough to be found in Christ, to be in union with Christ, to be raised with Christ, and not to have a life that matches the scripture is clear that where orthodoxy goes, orthopraxy must follow. Or to say it more simply, whenever there is a profession of truth, the life must bear witness to it. So when the apostle commands to seek the things that are above, understand he's not making a suggestion. Paul is not giving merely an encouragement. He's not making a recommendation. He says the word seek. Seek is a word of action. And he says it in such a way that without any more prefatory remarks, he's basically saying, you go and seek the things that are above. He's urging them to live a life of consistency in connection with their profession of faith. The commentator Hendrickson says it this way. Consistency requires that believers live in conformity with the fact that they were raised with Christ who is not only the object of their faith, but the source of their life. If then the Colossians were corporately raised when Christ was raised and they were raised with him, why should they seek salvation or fullness anywhere apart from him? Why should they resort to broken cisterns when the fountain of living waters is at hand? Again, Paul has expressed that a profession of faith requires a lifestyle that follows. Saints are not to be walking contradictions. So, for example, if I stand up here and I preach and I condemn drunkenness, and you all amen and you all agree, but then later on this evening you find me around the corner stumbling, mumbling, wearing the same suit, same tie, and it's my height, so you know it's me, you would look at me and say, hypocrite, hypocrite. You're going to stand there and tell us that this morning and then do the very thing that you condemn this evening? And you would be right to judge that way because my life and my words don't add up. And so again, recall the context in which the Apostle Paul is speaking because he sees a risk for the saints in Colossae that their profession of faith and their lives are not going to add up. Go back to chapter 2 in Colossians, and let's just read once again verse 20 to 23. Paul says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? 
Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And so the struggle for the saints in Colossae was a real one. Asceticism and self-severity for spiritual growth. Paul makes clear it's not enough. It's not enough. However much the flesh may wither, sins of the soul can still thrive. Another commentator says this, a man might whip and fast himself into a walking skeleton, and yet the spirit within him might have all of its lust unconquered, for all that it had lost was the ability to gratify them. To place a restraint on a robber's hand will not cure him of covetousness, though it stops him from the actual theft. To lacerate the flesh almost to the point of suicide merely incapacitates it for indulgence, but it does not touch, let alone extract, sinful desire in the heart. And so since severity and asceticism have no value in stopping the flesh, what is Paul's response? He says, look up, seek the things that are above. Well, what are the things that are above? I thought about this. I looked at the commentaries on this. And time is not available to detail all the things that are above. But I want to give us some encouragement to seek the things that are above. Earnest thought on grave matters concerning the soul. Sobriety around the day of judgment. Expectant rewards for one's faith. Also above the dwelling place of God and the spirits of just men made perfect. The eternal state, life everlasting, joy unspeakable, glorified bodies, true, unwavering, unbending, unending holiness, purity, love, and truth. Unbroken communion with God. Greater love of Christ increased knowledge of the person and work of Christ, more of Christ himself. Friends, we can't get that down here. We can't seek among the horizontal plane of life as we live it and find these things here among us. Paul says, look up. Go where you can find these things. Seek after these things and find them above. But then Paul is pleased to give encouragement for those who might be struggling to think about seeking these things. Paul was wise in this way because for many of us, we become so wearied and burdened by the life that we live here, which is marred by sin, which is troubled by the world surrounding us. There could be a sense of discouragement that says it's too hard to look up. Paul says, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Do we need any more encouragement to look up than to find Christ there waiting for us? <clears throat> where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. This is the penultimate encouragement for the saints of Colossae. Remember the one who is there, Jesus. The Hebrews writer says, the author and the perfecter of our faith. The psalmist says, it is him who is the lover of our souls. It's him who has set aside all glory for the rescue of his poor, pitiful creatures. Psalm 8 tells us that it is the one who is mindful of man, despite the vastness of the sky, the heavens, and the universe. The Apostle John says the one who is there is him who loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. It suggests that whatever the state of the saints in Colossae, however they have responded to what Paul has just said, when they hear Jesus, ears and eyes should look up. 
I'm not going to talk too much about what it means to be on the right hand of God. There's a number of passages I can give you afterwards if you want me to give them to him. But the fact of the matter is, is that that is significant to recognize that if Christ is at the right hand of God, there, as it says in Psalm 16, are pleasures forevermore. The call is to seek the things that are above, for that is consistent with the life of a Christian. And our lives, as it says in verse 4, are hidden with Christ. This brings us to our second point this morning. So now that we have up, raised with Christ, up, seek the things that are above, and up, because that is where Christ is, we come to point number two, things above things below. Verse 2, set your minds on things that are above. Now, if you're paying attention here, not just to me, but as you read your word, you recognize this is a little bit unusual. Paul just closed chapter 2 by telling them, all of your efforts to grow spiritually, to grow in holiness, to grow in grace through lacerating your flesh, starving your bodies beyond what is appropriate for a fast, all of that is going to fail. And so I think of myself being amongst the Colossians and thinking, okay, Paul, you just crushed all of my efforts to grow in holiness. You just made me feel as if everything that I'm doing is worthless. Now what? Now what, Paul? And so then I run through what Paul says. If then you have been raised with Christ, and so my thought would be, okay, Paul, no problem. Check, that's good. Seek the things that are above. Not a problem, Paul. You told me that. Seek the things that are above. I'm willing to do that. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Yup, understand, Paul. What else? Set your minds on things that are above. Now, if I'm one of the Colossians, I might be tempted to think, I'm already doing that, Paul. What are you talking about? You said seek the things that are above. That's done. But Paul wants us to understand he's not saying seek anymore. He's changed over and said set your minds on the things that are above. In other words, Paul is giving a different imperative here. And we want to be careful, saints, as we read the word of God, because sometimes we can just gloss over these things. But the fact that Paul has exchanged one S word for another means we should pause, <clears throat> pause and consider what he's saying. He says, set your mind on the things that are above. This is Paul calling the saints in Colossae to greater heavenly mindedness. He's calling us this morning by the spirit to greater heavenly heavenly mindedness. Again, we as saints spend too much time being concerned and weighed down by the things going on around us. We need to get above this world if we would have our souls fed. We need to get above this world if we would understand how to persevere until the end. We need to get above this world if we would see Christ in all of his glory. And the reality is, is that Paul is saying, now that you've begun to seek Set your mind there. Why is that important? It's important because when we begin seeking for something, think about a lost coin or think about a lost shoe or a favorite item of yours. Once you find it, what do you do? You stop seeking. You stop searching. Paul says something different. He says, seek the things that are above but then he goes on and says, in the midst of your seeking, you know what? I want you to just stop there. Just stay there. What a, wait, Paul, can I come back down here? No. Set your mind on the things that are above. Set it there. There's a couple of examples where Paul uses this. So just very briefly, let's turn to just two passages. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians 13, I'm going to be reading from the ASV only because I think it brings this out a little bit more. And we're looking for this idea of fixing our minds, staying there. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. It says, finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfected. Be comforted. Be of the same mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. That phrase there, be of the same mind. Again, Paul is giving a command. 
It's not a suggestion. He says to the saints in Corinth, be of the same mind on this given issue. He's not giving room for change. He's not giving room for diversity of opinion. He's saying all of you who are part of the church in Corinth, wherever your minds are on this particular truth, bring them together and then stay there. Be of the same mind. Or turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, still in the ASV, reading from verse 5. Paul again writing says, Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Again, there's no suggestions. Have this mind. Whatever the mindset was of the saints there in Philippi, bring all those minds together, lock down in this one position on this issue, and then stay there. And that's the idea that Paul is bringing out here to the saints in Colossae. He's saying, set your mind on the things that are above. Don't go and search and seek. Find one of those things that are above, maybe that one day you'll inherit a heavenly kingdom, and then say, okay, I've got this, great. Paul told me to seek I sought it out. Now I can go back to the earth below. No, Paul says, set your mind there. Stay there. Fasten your mind. Lock your mind. Rivet your mind. Bolt your mind to the things that are above. And again, it's where Christ is. Do we not want to be where Christ is? I trust you agree that we do. And yet this is in contrast to the last part of verse 2, which is our final subpoint this morning. Verse 2, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. The immediate context of Colossians has made clear that this is where the Colossians' minds were. They were on the things on the earth. They had an opinion that in order for them to grow in grace, to grow in holiness, to grow in righteousness, to grow in their understanding of Christ, they needed earthly means in order to spiritually grow. I don't know about you, but that don't even sound right to me. Earthly things to spiritually grow. Paul says in another place, I believe it's Galatians, he says, Having begun in the spirit, are you now being completed by the flesh? No. And so in attempting to know, experience, and joy, and flourish in these spiritual things, Paul is reminding them to look up. Where does this come from? Why does Paul draw out this thinking? Well, I'm going to submit to you that he does so because of the Lord Jesus himself. And so for our final passages this morning, please turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, beginning at verse 31. These are the Lord Jesus' words. Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? And I just want to pause for a second to say if you can see the comparison right there to what Paul said in Colossians chapter 3. Jesus says, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? What did Paul just say? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Both of them drawing upon these earthly things. Jesus is saying, don't be anxious over these earthly things. Paul is saying, stop handling these earthly things as if this is the means for growing in grace. Continuing with what the Lord Jesus says in Matthew 6, for the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Go up a couple of verses to verse 19. Still staying in Matthew 6. Verse 19 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. 
but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In each of these passages, the Lord Jesus Christ is calling the people's eyes from earth towards heaven. The reason? Because the life of his followers is not to look like the life of the Gentiles. Worries over what to eat and what to drink and what to wear. That's Gentile thinking. Jesus says that your heavenly father knows that you need these things already. So why are you fretting over them? Why would you worry about them? The life of those who profess the name of Christ must be about a heavenly kingdom and dwelling, not an earthly one. I want to close with one other comment this morning. Commentator says, attachment to things on the earth is unworthy of one who has risen with Christ. For they, meaning these earthly things, are beneath him. What can wealth achieve for him who has a treasure laid up in heaven? Too often when the things of earth are possessed, our hearts and minds concentrate on them. They look on them and our gaze becomes downward bent as opposed to heavenward. Things on earth too naturally draw us down. They attract us and fix us. Esau's red stew was more important than his natural birthright. Even the wedding guests who were invited to the king's ceremony turned away from the king for land and animals and families. The things of this world, friends, are transient. But the things of the world to come are permanent. The things of this world are temporal, but the things of the world to come are eternal. The things here below are time-bound, limited, and expiring, but the things above are everlasting, without limit, and enduring. Therefore, seek the things that are above. So as we close this morning, in terms of applications, I just want to ask a couple of questions for you to think over in your own mind and heart. The first and the most important question, have you been raised with Christ? Have you been raised with Christ? If your answer to that is no, then the good news is that you can be. You can be. Those who may be dead in their sins, dead in their trespasses, can be made alive with Christ this morning through repentance and faith. Now, somebody might be thinking either as you sit here this morning or perhaps you see online, but wait a minute, do I got to come up? Isn't there going to be an altar call? No, there's no altar call. Do I got to raise my hand? No, you don't need to raise your hand. Do you have to fill out a card? No, you don't have to do any of that. Where you sit, recognizing that you are a sinner under the judgment of God this morning, you can have the judgment removed from over your head by the blood of Christ through faith. Trusting in him and what he has done on the cross is sufficient. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and not only would you know the blessing of sin forgiven, but you too can be raised with Christ. The second question, as the Lord Jesus says and as Paul alludes to, where is your treasure? Where is your treasure? Paul stands with the Lord Jesus in saying that the things of earth are not the treasure of the people of God, for the treasure of the people of God is stored up in heaven. And so the passage itself is not saying that things on earth don't have their place of importance. There are things on the earth that have a place of importance. Food is important. And if you doubt me, stop eating for two days and then come and see me. Food is important. Clothing is important. Having a job is important. Caring for your wife and your family is important. 
Good relationships are important. Bodily health and bodily care is important. But as important as these things are, we should never be so fixated on them that we miss the Son of God in the process. That we miss that there's a heavenly kingdom coming in the process. That we miss the fact that this earth is not our home in the process. Jesus says, Matthew 6, 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If this is true, then saints, we don't want to lay up treasures on earth because our heart is not here. Our heart, our lives are with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then lastly, For those who are raised with Christ, my final question to you is where will you go from here? And what I mean by that is not where will you go to eat when you leave here. My question to you is in light of the things that you have heard, where will you go from here? I know that for myself, the temptation is to hear something like this, to read something like Paul is saying and think, I've got to go and try harder. I've got to try harder. I've got to, I've got to beat myself a little bit more. I've got to rein all these things in. I need to put more things in place. But I would caution you against that thinking because that's the very thing that Paul just got finished condemning in chapter 2. It's not about our working alone. I would give you something different to consider and suggest that you consider what Paul is saying. Instead of just trying to work harder, instead of just trying to work smarter, which will in and of themselves fail, instead, my encouragement to you would be to meditate on the realities of the things we have heard this morning. Let these things be in your mind and in your heart. In other words, in your time this afternoon, even following, even during the meditation on the Lord's table, even today, begin to seek the things that are above. What are those things that are above? It's displayed on the table. Christ, the person of Christ, the work of Christ. Let your mind begin to think on these things where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then once you begin to seek those things, which for many of us may start at the Lord's table again, Set your mind there. Don't go to the left. Don't go to the right. This world is waiting to distract you with everything. With everything, despite what you just heard. Here's the importance of setting our mind on the things that are above. So that when we go back out there, this doesn't immediately grab and snatch everything from us that the Lord has given to us this morning. Seek and set your minds on the things above, that is, the things of Christ. Let's close in prayer. Father, how we bless you for your word, how we thank you for your goodness, How grateful we are for your sending of the Lord Jesus Christ into this world to redeem a people for himself. And that so many of us are counted among those people. How thankful we are, Lord, that we have your word which instructs us how to live in this world during the time between the already and the not yet. We plead with you, Lord that the things that you have sown into our hearts this morning, that you have written on our hearts this morning, would not be snatched away by the evil one. That the thorns of this world would not strangle and choke out what we would heard. But instead, Lord, that you would take these things, you would seal them so in our hearts that even beginning this day, we would all begin setting our mind on the things that are above and being set there, Lord, help us to stay there. Help us to remember Christ. Help us to remember your word. Help us to remember the glories of heaven and to eagerly anticipate and wait for them until the return of our King or until you should call us home. 
These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.